Hi, everyone. Welcome to Talks at Google. Today, it is my absolute pleasure to welcome Steve Martino, Craig Schultz, and Karen Disher for the Peanuts movie. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, I would love to talk about, so this is such a huge kind of responsibility, you know, bringing peanuts into 2015 and into 3D. Um, so I'd love Steve to know, you know, how, how did you feel about this responsibility and working with Craig and working with, the, you know, the Schultz legacy? <laughs> well, working with Craig has been fantastic, but after our first meeting, you know, I was honored that uh, he wanted to work with me on the film, but as I went home, I was like, oh my gosh, this is, this is a huge responsibility. Uh, Peanuts is a big part of, it's like woven into the fabric of our lives. And I grew up with the TV special, you know, the Christmas special in particular. I think I was six years old when that first hit the air. Um, it was a big deal. And so, you know, as I got back to Blue Sky, the wonderful thing is that people started lining up at my door. It's like, I, you don't understand, I need to work on this movie because, and everybody's got a peanut story, you know, whether it was a Snoopy or a certain character that they connected with. Uh, so what I found as I arrived back at Blue Sky were a team of people who kind of joined me in taking on that responsibility, but we kind of made a commitment to do our very best to uphold, you know, the wonderful tradition that Peanuts has. Um, as you mentioned, you know, everyone kind of has a peanut story, and. Uh... Craig, I'd love to know for you where, where it came in. You know, you were a, screen, a, store, a screenwriter on this. Um, what, what part of your experience growing up with the Peanuts kind of came into play in making this film? Well, yeah, after seeing, uh, my, you know, my dad had over 50 specials and a lot of specials people have never seen before. He did a live action with, with animation before and some other stuff. So my son had gone to... Uh, film school and he became a screenwriter and in the process while he was doing that screenwriting I'd worked on a couple of previous projects one was Happiness is a Warm Blanket which is a direct to DVD special that came out a while ago and then the, probably the last TV special we did which is uh, He's a Bully Charlie Brown based on a marble story that my dad had always wanted to do so from that I had I was uh, in the mall one Christmas and I heard the song uh, Snoopy's Christmas which is from the old Royal Guardsman album and uh Within that, I had a vision of what that would look like animated. And I thought, boy, someday it'd be really cool if I could animate this thing, turn it into a TV special. And from that, it kind of grew, grew, grew until we met Steve from Blue Sky and, and blew it out into a full-blown movie. And Karen, I'd love to know, uh, Peanuts is, you know, st story panels and story is, is a very visual medium already, but you've got, you're drawing from, you know, 65 years worth of work. Uh, what was it like kind of taking on that task of starting, being the first step of translating this onto the screen? <laughs> It was terrifying. <laughs> I mean, really, it was the most intimidating thing I've ever done in my life. Not only from you know being a fan as a kid, growing up with it, not even imagining one day I'd get paid to like draw these iconic characters, but then to not mess it up. You know, I mean, I think that's been everyone's mantra at Blue Sky through this whole process: is don't mess it up, don't mess it up. Like. Please, we can't mess that up. <laughs> so yeah, it was, um, I mean, especially our first, you know, we did all these trips up to Santa Rosa to, to work in the Schultz compound and, you know, collaborate together. And you've got all the drawings of the characters up on the wall. And here I am sitting at a, at a table across from Craig Schultz. And here's my paper and my pencil. And now it's like, okay, draw Charlie, draw Charlie Brown. I'm like, oh God. <laughs> like, <laughs> Please don't judge me, you know, and, and the first few drawings I felt were horrible, but Craig was very generous and very nice and oh, good job, that looks great. I'm like, oh. it, it still probably took me a year to relax um, to where I just felt like, okay, I can just draw them and it's, and it's cool and, and no one will kill me. So, yeah. And those first weeks we were uh, working with paper. <clears throat> I mean, so much of our storyboard work now is on Cintiqs and digital. But our first trips up there to Santa Rosa, we got out the story pads, markers, uh, and there was no undo delete. You go to draw Charlie Brown and <laughs> you start and fail, it's a fail. Uh, I'd love to talk about the kind of drawing style of it because there was, there's this wonderful element of it where we see this, it's a 3D film, but it doesn't necessarily, it's not in your face. 
it's very, it felt very true to the poses, the characters. I love like their either profile or profile or they're like head on. And I think my favorite kind of little visual touch is all the little like 2D kind of yeah. accents. Um, can you guys talk about sort of developing that for it? Was it a technological challenge or was it just like, we got to have this in here, let's figure out how to do it? Was it just super easy? <laughs> no, it wasn't, it wasn't super easy. <laughs> no. uh, you know, where the, what it comes from is that I thought there was an opportunity with computer animation to you know, create the world in a way that would be rich, and yet it needed to be on style with what Sparky, Charles Schultz, uh, drew. And so I knew walking into this that I'm asking the world, Peanuts fans, that, who are going to go, really, CG? I don't know about that. Uh, so we went overboard to make certain that everything we did in terms of our animation style, our posing, uh, one of the mantras I had is I want to find the pen line in everything we do. Even though we're using computer animation, you can see in the style that we've chosen for Charlie Brown or any of the other characters, you can see that little wiggly pen line in his mouth or the little ink droplets for eyes. And that was a very purposeful decision to say, we're asking the audience to walk with us into you know, a 3D presentation of this film. We need to be very well anchored in everything else that we do, in pose, in animation, uh, even in the way we handle textures and materials. I actually would love to talk about the textures and materials because they were so, it's, this is such a nerdy thing, but they were so like, like I, tangible almost. Like I felt like they'd be like a little fuzzy if I touched them. But then the clothing felt very kind of realistic and the hair was very appropriate for the style. Um, and it, I don't know if it's necessarily something that has been in Blue Sky films before. Did you guys kind of revamp that process a bit or? We did. We actually ratcheted, when it comes to materials, we ratcheted ourselves back and said, you know, this is a particular style for this movie. The character silhouettes have to stand out first and foremost. I want to see the silhouette of that Charlie Brown pose. Uh, but we thought, well, we can add a little something. And I saw somebody brought a, their beagle. And uh, <laughs> that is one of, the, one of the reasons that I thought it would be exciting to use computer animation, to see Snoopy with soft fur. Uh, many people came up to me and their memory of uh, Peanuts came from a plush toy, you know? And I thought if we could bring the characters to life and have some of that softness and tactile quality, but it, what it required is that the textures always sit back a little bit. As a matter of fact, we got partway through the film and we were evaluating how the characters looked against the backgrounds. And we, I kind of reoriented our thinking to say, look, we need to just kind of pull back so stylistically everything felt like it was in the same style and world. I thought one moment where the 3D and the camera work also complemented the, the new style very well was the uh, aviation sequences. Uh, and I, I was curious as to kind of they're very different than the kind of grounded in the real world of Charlie Brown. Um, what was the approach to those, the flying ace sequences? <laughs> well, it comes from the comic strip. I, I tell you, everything in this movie, uh, it, the roots of any decision that we made comes from the comic strip. And as we, you know, spent time in Santa Rosa, looked through, you know, looked at original strips, and we had access to all of the comic strips, uh, if you look at any of the uh, Flying Ace or any of the fantasy sequence or fantasy comic strips that Charles Schultz drew, he drew with more perspective. All of a sudden you see roads going back, uh, you know, into depth. Uh, there was a lot more ink, you know, and detail. You'd see cobblestones and, you know, it just was a richer presentation in that pen and ink style. So for me, I thought, well, here's the opportunity to unhinge the camera you know, have a camera language that was more diagonals and dimensional and, and more camera movement because we're in Snoopy's imagination. And the comic strip was kind of suggesting that. And then in uh, Charlie Brown's world, it's a more kind of formal composition that really is derived from the comic strip. Craig, you're an aviator, are you not? Well, yeah, I've flown <laughs> for 40, you know, 40, 50 years, something like that. But the, the original concept for the movie was, it, it was called Snoopy vs. the Red Bear. And the original concept I had had was to take Charlie Brown's world, which is classic 2D right out of the Christmas special sort of look. And then my fantasy was to have that thing blend into the CG world. So when I first started presenting the idea and I went to Blue Skies, I knew they'd be able to handle the CG portion was, they said, well, we don't do 2D. I go, okay, that prints the problem. But Steve solved that problem with camera angles 
And so when you're in Charlie Brown's world, because these two worlds dovetail together, you really feel like you're looking at the comic strip. The camera doesn't pan all over the place. There's not a lot of movement. And you even said from the camera operator, like, well, is this all I got to do is just stick the camera and leave it there? And that's, that's sort of what it was until we get into Snoopy's mind. And I think the unique thing is once you're in Snoopy's world, we actually finally get to see what Snoopy's thinking. You know, we see Snoopy fly in the Halloween special and so forth. We see him in the comic strip, but we've never really seen what goes on in his mind. And this movie gave us a chance to really you know, see what Snoopy really thinks and how this crazy dog can visualize the world. And that was really exciting from a camera standpoint and a movie standpoint. And from my writing standpoint, it really opened it up. Well, the most fun, Craig owns a biplane. And early in the journey, he took me up in that biplane. It's like, okay, here's what a dog fight's like. And we went up and we did stalls, we did loops. And there was amazing things that I learned from that, just from a, an audio perspective. Like when you go up in a stall, the sound, the engine just cuts out. <laughs> you go flying down. Anyway, uh, that helped. Yeah, and then to be honest. <laughs> Then to be authentic, we had you know, Skywalker Sound found out. They go, Craig has a biplane? Oh, can we record that? So we had Skywalker Sound come out, and we had mics put on the airplane, on the engine on the outside. We had 10 people on the ground, and we did a bunch of low passes, and I had a girl in the cockpit doing all the aerobatics, so we got all the Doppler effect sounds, and uh, they were thrilled. And we did a lot of authentic sounds within the movie. I think the most creative one we did is the movie opens, you'll see a pin line go across the screen. And uh, what we did is we had our art director take the original pen that my dad used and his ink and his original paper he used and then Lucas Sound went up and recorded those pen line movements that are just exactly like my dad would have done as he was drawing the comic strip and we recorded ice skates as kids skate they're actually ice skating sounds from my dad's ice rink I put into the movie so a lot of nice little touches like that. Um, I'd love to know and Karen I'd actually like to hear your thoughts on this first because I think it would probably be the, e the easiest to kind of get I don't want to say like trapped in the shadow of, but but keep reusing the original material as reference. But you guys are obviously bringing your own kind of story to this. So I'd love to know for you, what was it like kind of striking a balance between the classic imagery of the original comics and then sort of bringing your guys' own take on it? Yeah, that was definitely really hard, especially for me. Like I was saying, like it was intimidating just wanting to draw the characters exactly right, exactly on model, which when you're doing um, storyboarding for a feature that's, typically not um, really productive, because you kind of got to work fast, you know, it's a very, the, the work of a storyboard artist is to just redo, 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 you're just the first line of, of the, the work, you're testing things out, if they don't work, you know, you didn't spend two months animating something, you spent maybe a day or two, and you can just throw it away. So you got to work fast, but I would just, I mean, honestly, I'll, I'll confess, I just traced for probably <laughs> the first <laughs> month or two, I would go to the website, find a Charlie Brown pose, and then just, okay, at least I know I'm not, again, disrespecting the, the tradition and the memory and the heritage or doing something crazy. And then I started to realize that that was really paralyzing me and not enabling me to do my job the way I should, which is to be thinking of new stuff and thinking of gags and, like, pushing the envelope. So I finally got over it and relaxed, and I was like, okay, his head's not perfect here, but who cares? It still looks like Charlie Brown. So <laughs> it was tricky. It was tough. It, it was not like any other thing I've worked on, but uh, it was awesome. I think also from a story perspective, we wanted to strike this balance of uh, there can be moments for fans where you're like, oh, I remember something like that from before. But we didn't want the movie to be just a collection of uh, greatest hits from the past. It's a feature film. Craig and Brian and uh, Neil Uliano, the, the writing team, you know, crafted a feature film story with narrative drive, character arc, you know, a, a real feature story. The characters are, you know, they're based on the characters we know. So those, those things don't change. Uh, and if now and again we might intersect into a moment that we remember from the comic strip, you know, that's a nice little added beat, but there were, you know, the story is new, so there are a lot of new things in there as well. But, you know, we also, um, we really did push the envelope at times, because we would get be together in Santa Rosa, and it was usually uh, myself, our head of story, Jim Camerud, um, our animation supervisor, Nick Bruno, and we definitely did what animators do, and, you know, Nick would draw Charlie Brown naked and, you know, we, you know, put in a toilet gag. And we all knew that none of these would see the light of day, nor should they. But it's still, you kind of get it out of your system and you have fun with it. And it just kind of helps you loosen up all in all. That's where Craig came in. Yes. <laughs> That's when Craig learned to say the word no <laughs> over and over and over again. And he was always right. <laughs> 
Um, I think one wonderful way, though, that you guys have kind of honored the tradition of it is Bill Melendez is the voice of, of Snoopy. Oh, yeah. And uh, how, how did you guys do? <laughs> well, Craig and I made that trip down to uh, his you know, to his office. Yeah, that was something I really wanted to do when, it, when we were talking about the voices and it hadn't come up yet. And also we talked about Snoopy and Woodstock and so forth. I said, wouldn't it be cool if we could get Bill a credit in the movie? You know, so we called Melendez Studios. Steve and I went over there when we dug in to their archives and found out really how much stuff they had saved over the years of Bill being Snoopy and Woodstock. And we had enough material oh. to put in the movie and craft all the voices we needed. So that was phenomenal. I, and I'm really proud that we did that for Bill. Well, and it's, I love honoring Bill, but when we put those clips into our first story reels, there's no way we could have created anything as funny and as charming. He was amazing. Uh, you know, they're just sounds that he that Snoopy makes. It's like comedy gold, and there was no reason to recreate it. And we worked with Randy Tom. He figured the formula out. Randy works at Skywalker Sound. Um, you know, so we could have, if need be, uh, recreated. But thankfully, we used Bill. Yeah, you know, we all go through our lives and come across one or two people that you will never forget. And Bill, Bill Melendez was one of those type people. He was so big and boisterous and had this big mustache. He was always happy. And it's like anyone that met Bill would never forget Bill. He was a tremendous person. He passed away a couple of years ago. But uh, I remember when I was like 10 years old, he took me out shotgun shooting, trap shooting. It was tremendous trap shooting. And, and I've, I've never forgotten that 50 years later. I still remember going trap shooting with Bill. Mm -hmm. And then can you talk a little bit about the, uh, the new voice cast? Because you've got some wonderful young actors. And Yes, I couldn't be more proud of uh, of the group of actors all kids and where it starts Craig and I talked about this at the very beginning you know Charlie Brown for me was Charlie Brown from the Christmas special Linus was Linus from the Christmas special the Halloween special those voices imprinted on me and as there were specials that came later as a kid even I'm like well that's not quite the Charlie Brown and you know that I remember so it was one of the things I was most nervous about. And in particular, I was nervous about us casting a Linus because Linus has this beautiful little lisp. And uh, Christian Kaplan, who's our casting director, scoured the country, thousands of audition tapes. Thankfully, I didn't have to listen to all you know, thousands of them. He narrowed them down. Uh, but I'm so happy with uh, the voices that we found. And, and the objective was to try to match the cadence, the rhythm, and the kind of vocal timber of, uh, of those original characters. And you know, when we found Linus with that lisp, I'm like, oh my gosh. He, he came to Blue Sky uh, two weeks ago, and uh, they were just touring him around the studio. Because often we do our recording outside of uh, our studio. And he was walking around the studio. Every animator's like, oh, say something. Say Charlie Brown. <laughs> say, they just wanted to hear Linus's voice. Yeah, it is amazing. I mean, I was fresh off uh, the Blanket movie where we had to do the casting, and I discovered that the best way to get audition the kids was to not have them come in and read lines from the Christmas special, the Halloween special. The best way was to have them come in and simply introduce themselves, tell me what school they go to, what grade they're in, and what their hobbies are. And invariably, when we cast that movie and this movie, within, I'd say, no more than five words, I knew if they were right or wrong. And you just start chucking them out. Nope, 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 nope. When they get in the acting, it's a little different because then a lot of people can mimic stuff and, and parody stuff. But when you, you want them to just kind of be genuine, heartfelt, and, and not do much acting, and our kids, I think, are spot on. Everybody's seen the movies really said, boy, those, that cast is, is just dead on. And, you know, it's interesting working with kids, and I, I love working with kids. I've coached soccer my entire life, and uh, what is amazing is they have such rich imaginations. When we record, we don't have any footage uh, because we're recording the voices, and then we animate to those voices, and then the movie starts to take shape. So I'm asking any actor to go on a journey with me in a room that is just four walls and a microphone, and we talk about what the scenario is, what's going on, and they were amazing in the way that they could imagine themselves there and create. It's like it was so easy for them, uh, but it was good fun. The recording sessions were a great time. The other cool thing that's a little bit of trivia in there is that you know the movie's called The Peanuts Movie by Schultz, and, uh, and the by Schultz is important because there's four generations of Schultz. Obviously, 90% of the movie comes from my dad's comic strip. Then there's myself, his son, and his grandson, which is my son. But beyond that, there's his great-grandson as the voice of a little character we call a little kid. That's a little kindergartner kid character. 
And he was cool because his voice is distinctly different than the rest of the kids in the movie. You recognize that this isn't a voice I've heard before. And uh, it was fun putting him in the film. Um, I think one of my last questions for you is, um, why do you think we need Charlie Brown in this day and age? And what is one of the things that you are most excited for audiences to kind of connect with, with this new film? I tell you, for me, and I've grown to appreciate Charlie Brown so much more, uh, what I love about what Craig and Brian and Neil did is they looked at the you know, 50 years of Charlie Brown and said, well, you know, what are the qualities that he has? There were comic strips often where he had to put up with Sally, his nagging you know, little sister. And, and from that, we've got a wonderful theme in the story where we get to hold up the qualities that he's always had, that Charlie Brown is kind. He's honest, and most of all, he perseveres. He's the guy that never wins that baseball game. That kite never flies, but he picks himself back up, and he tries again. And he became kind of the, uh, the spirit of the making of this movie, at least for me. You know, when, when we were trying to work on something and, you know, we would have one of those failures, like, oh, that doesn't look right, or, you know, I'd go home, it's like, oh, we're going to do this. If it was a bad day, I'd put on my Charlie Brown sweatshirt the next day. It's like, today's the day we're going to win the game. <laughs> yeah, I think the very first day I went back to Blue Sky, and we just met with Steve and so forth, we had the whole Blue Sky team come in. I asked an interesting question. I said, how many of you in the audience think that Charlie Brown is bald? And probably 60% of the people put their hands up. I thought, oh my god, I'm in trouble already. And then <laughs> we got into designing Charlie Brown. But, I think I kind of led sort of a Charlie Brown life because when you're the son of a celebrity, for example, you have a lot of people come to your house, your kids are coming all the time, you always got to ask yourself, you know, do they really like me for who I am or do they like me just because of being around, you know, Sparky's house and the swimming pool and everything else? And the journey in Charlie Brown, he's, he's, he's dealing with that same thing, which we all deal with. Am I like, do people like me for who I am and so forth? So we explored that journey in, in Charlie Brown's world of what it would be like. I also was interested in the journey with how people see yourselves and see each other's as, as small children when they see each other. You know, I remember being in third grade and seeing this girl and I literally felt like I was in love when I was in third grade. And I look at third graders now and they're these little tiny things, how could I possibly have been in love in third grade? But those little kids have those complex feelings and that's again what my dad expressed in the comic strip and we kind of carried that theme into the movie that they do have those complex thoughts and uh, very adult little, they're just small. <laughs> With big heads. <laughs> I think for me, um, why we still need Charlie Brown very much is he's he's a he's just a good guy. Like when you walk out of the movie, you have this. Um, it just has a very timeless feeling, you know. You're not in the modern day. You're not like a hundred years ago. It just kind of feels timeless. And he is just someone you either know or you are. You know, we all try for things and fail, as as Craig and Steve said, but. But he's he's just a good guy, and there's not snark in this movie, you know. There's not pop culture references. Um, it's just it's just a very, in a way, a very simple and plain story. You know, he's not going to go to another planet and like save the galaxy. But what kid is, you know? And and so it's a very aspirational movie in a in a different way. You know, it's 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 going to tell every kid who has a bad day, like, you know, it's all right because I was a good guy at the end of the day. You know. So, we have time for just a few audience questions. Kevin here is going to ask them on behalf of the internet. <laughs> Hello. So, um, I want to start with all three of you. And so, what is, which is your favorite character and why? And Karen, maybe which one was your favorite to work with? And also, uh, Craig, maybe talk about also um, who your father's favorite character was to write for. Okay, well, Loaded. I mean... I think from a pure animation standpoint, Snoopy is going to be where you can have the most freedom. You know, freedom of movement and the craziness of the, the stuff he can do that you just can't do with, um, or shouldn't do maybe, <laughs> with the human characters. But yeah, free, Snoopy is just pure animation. And Woodstock's really fun to do too. Like he, people kind of forget about him as the little sidekick, but he's he's so much fun. And then you get the Beagle Scouts in there and it's this group of little birds and Possibilities are endless, and uh, some of the Snoopy Woodstock scenes in the in the movie are the best, in my opinion. They're just because there's no dialogue. You can't use it as a crutch. You can't like send it in for punch up for new funny lines. It's like pure, just action and gags and slapstick, and 
Fun. Yeah, I think for me, I think what was almost profound for me is that as Steve's team got the animation done, yeah, we have characters from the very first comic strip. We have Shermie, we have Violet, we have Patty, we have all the classical characters. And I literally fell in love with them all over again because the way you see them now in 3D and CGI, they become much more identifiable. Um, in the movie, I love Sally. I've always loved Sally. I think she's, she's hilarious and, and so forth. And a funny Sally story is we were casting the voice. I walked in, and, and they didn't know who I was. It was my first time out to... Uh, to watch some voices being recorded, and she was sitting there in the aisle, and I, I said, so you're, you're playing Sally? And she says, yes. I said, well, can you, can you read me off one of the lines from the Christmas special? And she just went into the speech, and she could do the full-blown, every line from the Christmas special she had memorized, and she just rattled them out. And her, she, her name's Mariel, and she was just phenomenal to work with, and uh, later on she found out who I was, but uh, that was fun. Give uh, her a little bit of stage, and she'll fill it up. <laughs> She's gone, yeah. And the second part of the question was... There was uh, just who, maybe who your father's favorite character was to uh, write for. I never like to speak for what my father would have thought and so, and so forth. All I can say is that, for the most part, it, my dad will typically say that most of his personality, he was Charlie Brown. Charlie Brown, who, who, he, who, he, who, he, who he was, and Snoopy was what, who he would have liked to have been. I mean, the fantasy that Snoopy has, I think we all have these fantasies, and my dad obviously lived in that same kind of world, and that's probably the easy way to sum it up. He was really... Every character was a piece of my dad at some level, but I think the majority of my dad was Charlie Brown, which is not a bad thing to say. <laughs> um, and Steve, uh, did you guys ever consider a different type of animation for this? I know Blue Sky is obviously a, a 3D stu you know, CGI studio, but any, ever consider stop motion or 2D for this? No, but we added a lot of 2D animation to the movie. Uh, as a matter of fact, one of some of my favorite uh, moments in the film, uh, Charlie Brown, whenever he imagines, uh, dreams, a little thought bubble will pop up. It's all 2D. It, it looks to me. I always say it's the, it's the daily strip. So it's black and white. It's done in pen and ink. Uh, to me, it's some of the nicest uh, peanuts animation. Uh, ever done because it really looks like Sparky's pen line come to life. Uh, and we ended up adding a lot more 2D than I think we ever thought we would uh, starting in the movie. So there's always lots of little speed lines. You know, uh, Lucy gets bonked on the head with a typewriter, and of course you have to have those little flowery bonks and typography. Uh, so there's plenty of 2D mixed in with the 3D. Uh, but, you know, our paintbrush... And, and I felt that there was something we could do with 3D that would bring this uh, world to life in a, in a different way. And he, did, and he did a wonderful job. There's a transition in out of Charlie Brown's world to Snoopy's fantasy world, which we struggled with for a while. And Steve went back and studied what Melendez had done. And again, not only did he go to my dad's comic strip, we also did a lot of going to Melendez. And Melendez had these phenomenal color backgrounds and almost psychedelic stuff from the 70s they put in there. And Steve's team found a way to blend that. And with 3D, it really looks wonderful. So your, um, your slides show a lot of analysis that I have not seen before. Are you going to have a tie-in with the Schultz Museum so that you can present some of the analysis, whether that's the historical change through time, it was a really nice layout, or how are the, you know, how is, how are the characters laid out on the page? I've never seen that before, although I've looked at all the strips. Right. What's right. your tie-in with the museum? Well, there's an exhibition uh, that's up right now at the museum that uh, has even a few of the slides that are from my presentation. You know, it's kind of done up in museum style, uh, kind of talking about uh, some of the journey. And uh, they've, they've done a wonderful interactive uh, part of the museum as well that's kind of tied into the movie. And I've done uh, a couple of talks. I gave a talk there. Well, we had a whole team, a whole panel. Karen was there. Uh, we were there two weeks ago, I think it was, uh, and did a panel. And I had done a similar kind of presentation to all of their major donors. The museum is such a part of this journey for us. So, um, yeah, maybe there'll be more after that. Yeah, that's, for those of you that haven't been up there, we just had an exhibit called Animating Comics, which kind of showed the, how the early stuff was done. And uh, that transition into the Blue Sky exhibit right now, which they're just putting up right now. We have uh, a couple of great photo op things where you can literally get on the doghouse. And behind you is going to be the Eiffel Tower, the clouds, and get a nice picture of yourself sitting on Snoopy's doghouse, which is a full-blown 3D model they made up there. It's a, it's a beautiful exhibit being installed at this time. So come on up to Santa Rosa. See us. Um, so I have so many fond memories of the music from the specials. And I'd love to hear some of your thoughts about... Uh, uh, how you planned or uh, how you 
uh, decided on musical choices for the movie? You know, it follows the overriding objective for the film, which was uh, this is a new story, but based on characters that we've loved. Uh, we want moments that are those touchstones for fans. And so, you know, first and foremost, uh, Christoph Beck was our composer on the film. And as uh, I spoke with him, as we discussed uh, music for the movie, first and foremost, the, mu the music needed to support the storytelling. Uh, but that said, there are moments that we have jazz combo. You, you can't have a movie like this without Linus and Lucy theme. So we have Vince Guaraldi's original performance, you know, in a couple of important moments in the film. And then we also, uh, I had the chance to work with Megan Trainer, uh, who's a contemporary artist. Uh, and she really seemed to capture the spirit of Charlie Brown and Peanuts and wrote two original songs. We originally, uh, I was working with her to write one song for the film in one particular area that I thought she would just be right for. And she did that and it was amazing. And then she got to know the story and this Charlie Brown story just kind of sunk in with her and she wrote this other song just out of the blue, sent me a demo, said, you know, it just came to me because I was so taken by the story. And so make certain to stay through the early part of the credits. Both songs are in there in kind of their full form. Uh, so it's been quite a mix. You know, there are times in the story where the, f you know, the power of a full orchestra is the way to underscore the emo you know, that particular moment. And then there are other places where the jazz combo does it. And then there are places where a Megan Trainor song actually helps service the story. And that was what was most important. Thank you. I think this is our last question. So uh, first of all, I really would like to thank you all for doing this. And I've been a Peanuts fan for over 40 years. I grew up with this. And um, I watch Peanuts in three different languages in, in four different countries. So this is huge to me personally. Um, and I actually spent a whole day at the museum yesterday, saw the beautiful exit, got the picture done, wearing the gear. Um, probably I was the oldest person to do that, but I didn't care. No, um, I doubt anyway, it. Anyway, I just, my question to you, especially to, to Craig, um, your dad passed away in 2000, and um, I know that he made it clear, actually, even in his interview, that you guys, actually, the children and the father agreed that there will be no more of drawing of, of peanuts. So, um, but now to see this is beautiful. But so as an, a lifetime fan, my greatest concern for the, the Peanuts franchise and, and this legacy is that how are we going to just somehow continue this into the 21st century? Because this is something that started in the 1940s and, and the, there's a generation now growing up watching this really sen like sensory-oriented sensory cartoons. This is something different. Um, so therefore, I think this is a beautiful thing, but also I would like to ask you, what is the plan for this franchise? Are you guys now, the children, and, and, um, and Mrs. Schultz, agreed to create more, a little bit different stories? Is it okay? Are you going to continue? This is a momentum, and are you gonna keep going on to create more Peanuts legacy that will be more suitable to the 21st century? Well, I think, <clears throat> let me kind of address a couple of these things. Um, number one, as far as the comic strip, you know, we, we feel the comic strip was like Picasso's art. You're not going to have somebody else come in and try to copy Picasso. So you know, we knew that the comic strip was sacrosanct. And the, and the family met with an attorney back in the 70s, and we told her dad, he said, we don't, you know, we did, my dad was going to have somebody else do the comic strip when he passed on and, you know, just so have income for the family. And the family said, no, dad, we don't want anyone to draw this comic strip. This is your work. You've done this every... Every strip, every letter is strictly yours. We would never have somebody even think about drawing the comic strip. On the other hand, you, you know, there are Peanuts fans. We all love Peanuts. We want Peanuts to continue. So there it becomes a dilemma. How do you, continue, how do you make Peanuts continue you know, without, without doing something new? Well, the comic strips, again, we've been, we've been really blessed and lucky that the, all the newspapers have continued to do reruns of the comic strips. And I find that the comic strips today are as relevant as they were in the 1960s and 1950s. The themes apply to all of us. The messages are the same. It's all about heart and, and, and so forth. Um, when it comes to the movie, you know, we want to bring in a new generation. Newspapers have disappeared. Kids are all just working on their iPhones and iPads. They don't see the old content. So the best way to do that is to have a via, creative vehicle that's going to drive them back to that media. And, and my hope for the movie, my main hope was that the movie would be the rock and the pond and the ripple effect was going to be what's going to drive all you people after seeing the movie to wonder, 
good. She's a little girl, Sally. She seems more interesting. I need to know more about her. I need to know more about Shermie. Go back and read the comments of the books and really find the message that my dad created because this is just a tiny, tiny sampling of what that world is all about. Thank you all so much. And uh, everyone, go enjoy the Peanuts movie and visit the Peanuts Museum, or the Schultz Museum. <laughs> Thanks for joining us today. Thank you for having us.